on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We've got a brand new lineup every Saturday night on GB News. From 6 p.m., I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8 p.m. as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Brand new Saturday nights on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good morning to you and welcome to Sunday with Michael Portillo with two hours of good conversation, arts and entertainment, ethical dilemmas and a sense of the ridiculous too. It's been nearly 25 years since the Belfast Agreement that brought peace to Northern Ireland was made on Good Friday, 1998. The celebration of the anniversary may be muted, both because the institutions created in the Accord are not functioning and because a senior police officer was shot recently and the terror threat level in the province has been raised. What is the future of Northern Ireland? At the height of the troubles, the IRA made a meticulous plan to assassinate Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher by planting a bomb at the hotel in Brighton being used by the Conservatives for their conference. A new book describes the plot and the police investigation. As we head into a new tax year, it's 50 years since VAT was introduced at a rate of 8%. How fair is it now that it's more than doubled to 20%, but is paid by everyone, regardless of means. And Michelangelo's masterpiece, the nude statue of David, has been denounced by some parents in Florida as pornography. Is art that titillates degenerate? All that and more after the news with Tatiana Sanchez. Michael, thank you very much and good morning. This is the latest from the GB newsroom. The port of Dover has run extra ferry services overnight to try to clear a backlog which has seen passengers delayed for up to 14 hours. The port declared a critical incident yesterday as traffic built up from the Easter holiday getaway with coaches at the cruise terminal facing the longest waits. Ferry services have cited bad weather and hold-ups at French border control with the port saying additional coach bookings had impacted operations. Travel expert Simon Calder told us it's been miserable overnight for thousands of people. Exit. We asked for um, tougher checks. So when you turn up at Dover, previously you just sort of waved the passport out of the window and that would be fine. Now um, we asked to be treated as third country nationals. So an officer is supposed to go through the uh, passport, checking all your stamps. Um, they then need to stamp the passport themselves. And that takes much, much longer than it did previously. Multiply that by 50 or 60 people on board a coach and you get delays. The Home Secretary is to introduce new measures to tackle child sexual abuse. Writing in the Mail on Sunday, Swella Braverman has announced those working with children will have a legal duty to report signs or suspicions of sexual abuse. It follows an independent inquiry last year which described sexual abuse of children as an epidemic. Three British men are being held in Taliban custody in Afghanistan. They include the so-called danger tourist Miles Routledge, who had to be rescued from Kabul by British forces less than two years ago. A humanitarian network that's assisting two of the men says it believes they're in good health and are being treated well. The Foreign Office says it's working hard to make contact with them. Anthony Joshua has won his heavyweight fight against Jermaine Franklin. The British boxing champion put in a somewhat laboured display at the O2 Arena last night, securing a unanimous points victory in 12 rounds. It's Joshua's first time back in the ring since losing to Alexander Usyk last August, earning him his 25th professional win. He said a battle of Britain with Tyson Fury is now the fight the boxing world needs. What can I say? It's, a, it's an honour to win, of course. That's what we train for. But let's say a fight I'm losing. He has to just rebuild and come again. I'm going to stop putting that amount of pressure on myself and just work hard and do my best. That's all I can do. Now. 
And the Pope has led a Palm Sunday service in Rome a day after being sent home from hospital with bronchitis. Around 30,000 people came to watch Pope Francis opening Easter celebrations, which mark the start of Holy Week. The 86-year-old was driven to St Peter's Square in the Vatican City, sitting in the back of an open-topped car passing through the crowds. The Pope was taken to hospital on Wednesday complaining of breathing difficulties, but he returned home to the Vatican yesterday. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now, though, it is back to Sunday with Michael Portillo. Uh, welcome back and uh, thank you, Tatiana. This Easter will be the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement reached in Belfast in 1998. It very largely ended the troubles that have plagued Northern Ireland since the late 1960s. The bombings and the shootings ended and British soldiers disappeared from the streets of Northern Ireland as Unionists and Republicans joined together to govern the province, sharing power in an assembly and an executive at Stormont. But this week, the terrorism threat level in Northern Ireland was raised from substantial to severe, meaning that an attack is highly likely. The move, based on an MI5 intelligence assessment, shows a rise, uh, it follows a rise in distant Republican activity, including in particular the shooting of Detective Chief Inspector John Cordwell. It reverses a downgrade in the Northern Ireland's threat level last year, which was the first change for 12 years. The United States President Joe Biden is strongly rumoured to be planning to visit Northern Ireland to mark the 25th anniversary, and former President Bill Clinton and his wife Hillary are also expected. But how muted will or should the celebrations be, given the threat level and given that devolved government in the province is suspended? In a moment, we'll talk to former Northern Ireland Secretary Sean Woodward under Gordon Brown and Professor of British and Irish Politics Jonathan Tongue. But first, uh, Dougie Beatty, uh, GB News Northern Ireland uh, correspondent and reporter, joins me from Stormont. Uh, Dougie, you're standing in front of uh, disused institutions. What is the mood in Northern Ireland at the moment with the threat level as it is and with those institutions not being active? Well, good morning, Michael. And uh, yes, 25 years ago, I was just down the road from here at Castle Buildings awaiting that deal to appear. Uh, the then leader, David Trimble and John Hume, the two men that brought that uh, uh, agreement here. And of course, things have moved on terribly from there. And, and the feelings in Northern Ireland, you've got to remember there's a whole generation. I mean, my children never remembered a bomb or a bullet going off. My son's 24 years of age. And, uh, you know, none of that would hear of remembered and that is a good thing in Northern Ireland and most people are delighted that that is here. So it has gone on all, all that whole generation. None of them will remember uh, having to open or you know I mean I still start my car in the mornings with the door open because back in the day if, if you if your your family or yourself were involved in security forces or even the media sometimes you were targeted and, and all of that has gone and this new threat is not saying any of that is back. In fact that uh, attempt at murder of John John Caldwell caused a whole pile of searches in Northern Ireland throughout uh, unionism and republicanism uh, and I think it's more what was found in those raids. You've got to remember four of the first arrests uh, after that attempt at murder were unionist or people from unionist communities that were brought in along with those from Republican communities. So I think it's more what has been found during those raids that uh, has maybe caused or spooked MI5 to put the threat of uh, terrorism uh, up to severe, meaning that another th um, attack is more likely to be. Um, for Joe Biden to come here next week, it is all going to be downgraded ever so slightly. Uh, people here have got, I wouldn't say fed up with storm out up and down. I mean, it was down for three years with Sinn Féin. Then it came back for a year. Then it went down again over the um, framework document or protocol. And it's, it's not really going anywhere, Michael. It's staying very much where it is. And behind us here, of course, 
if the DUP decide that they're going to go back in, the framework document that is there now, lots of businesses are actually saying it's worse, that there will be border checks uh, coming into Irish ports, that the green lanes are retail lanes, they're not really green lanes at all. In fact, the only lanes that are green lanes are coming from the Irish Republic, many describing the Windsor framework as an old frustration uh, Soviet document that stopped those countries dealing with the West. So if the DUP go back in, they may lose uh, part of their votes to the TUV, because of course Sinn Féin are now the largest party, but they didn't get any bigger. They just, DUP lost two seats to the true unionist voice, which is on the right of unionism. And then of course, Doug Beattie, my namesake, of the Ulster Unionist Party, is sitting on the other side, he's prepared to go back in here, and the DUP could lose votes to them. So the DUP have a very, very fine line to walk here, will they go back in or will they not? But the people of Northern Ireland are saying, what about our health service? What about our infrastructure? What about our schooling? That's the things that they're saying because they don't remember 25 years back to when that violence was there. Uh, Dougie Beatty, thank you very much. That's an absolutely splendid summary of the mood in Northern Ireland and its history over the last 25 years. Well, Sean Woodward was Northern Ireland Secretary between 2007 and 2010. And Jonathan Tung is Professor of British and Irish Politics at the University of uh, Liverpool. Um, Professor Tung, first of all, just going back to this uh, attack on this very se senior policeman, Mr Cordwell, um, what organisation do you think organised the attack and what could its motivation have been? It was probably the new IRA. The new IRA really replaced the real IRA, which in turn replaced the provisional IRA uh, when, the, when the troubles ended. Uh, I, I suspect that violent, dissent Republican activity will never fully go away this side of the United Ireland, but we do need to keep it in perspective. It, it is, by and large, low-level violence. There have been some horrific episodes, Massarine in 2009, uh, Omer in, in 1998, of course, when 29 people lost their lives. But if you look overall, 3,600 people died before the Good Friday Agreement due to the security situation. 165 have lost their lives due to the security situation since the Good Friday Agreement. So we're talking a, a level of violence overall at about 5% or slightly less than the level that you saw during the Troubles itself. So these organisations, they're still around. They, they perhaps never will go away, but they are not the overall threat, nowhere near the overall threat uh, that they once were. Tell me about the particular motivation, uh, John, in this case, as far as you can deduce it. Well, top of the list of targets for uh, violent, dissident Republicans would be the police service of Northern Ireland, who they would still see as a British police force, a colonial police force in, in, in their vernacular. And you know, in, in terms of being brutally effective, it's still quite a task for a Catholic to join the police service of Northern Ireland because some of these violent, dissident Republicans would know where they live, whereas there's relative safety for those from a unionist background uh, to, to join the police service in Northern Ireland. And in some ways, you know, Catholic recruitment to the police service in Northern Ireland is still quite difficult. For 10 years, we had 50-50 Catholic, non-Catholic recruitment to the police service in Northern Ireland to make the police force more representative in, in compositional terms than the old Royal Ulster Constabulary. But once policing and justice were devolved to the Northern Ireland Assembly, ironically, the only piece of significant power that has been devolved to that to that assembly uh, given the regular collapses we've seen of the political institutions well that was never going to be accepted by unionists who didn't like the replacement of the royal Ulster constabulary many of them uh, anyway so since then since you've had that the end of 50 50 recruitment it has been something of a struggle for the police service in northern ireland to recruit from the catholic community yeah. Yeah. even though Sinn Féin now endorses that new police service uh, let me turn to uh, Sean Woodward. Um, Sean, uh, welcome to GB News. You were Northern Ireland Secretary, I suppose, in a way during a fairly golden age. To, to, to what extent are you uh, depressed by what's happened in the recent past, the change in the threat level and the fact that the institutions in Northern Ireland are not operational? Good morning, Michael. I think I wouldn't sound depressed. I think I'm realistic about this. I mean, there's a pattern of history here which is very relevant to all of this, which is that whenever the main body of Irish republicanism reaches some political accommodation and enters into the politics, which is effectively what happened with the Good Friday Agreement, the pattern of history says that you're going to get some group that will, however regrettably, split away, still making a spurious claim for the so-called armed struggle. 
That indeed is what happened with the Good Friday Agreement, and we saw, however, horrifically, we saw the real IRA commit the criminal atrocity of the Omer bombing just a few months after it was signed. So I think the government is wise with uh, the security services to be raising the threat level as we celebrate the Good Friday Agreement, which, as the professor has just rightly pointed out, has led to a dramatic shift in the killings and murders and maimings and bombings um, in Northern Ireland and, of course, in, in Great Britain. So there's a level of prudence here. Um, but I do think there is a couple of very important political points to be made here. The first is that Rishi Sunak is to be congratulated on reaching the protocol, the so-called Windsor framework. And that's really, really important because political stability in Northern Ireland is, is as it were, the prize of all this. If the politics works, people are happy in the mainstream. So that's really important. And that's the best way to deal with terrorist threats. But the government as such has been culpable of really not paying enough attention to Northern Ireland for quite a long time. And I think Prime Minister Johnson has a lot to answer for, not in any shape or form being responsible for the attempted murder of the police officer recently, uh, not in, in any way that I'm suggesting that he's responsible for any of these criminal activities. But Northern Ireland was somewhat taken for granted uh, after we left office in 2010. And the consequence of taking Northern Ireland for granted is that you get these crazy groups of people. The real IRA is replaced by the new IRA in 2012. And undoubtedly, they will be looking for publicity. So they will be running around making noises right now. The security services have responded to that. And the question is, will they be able to pull something off? And you may recall, Michael, from your time in, in active politics, that what's always said about terrorism is, is it where if we see ourselves, all governments here, as the good guys, keeping law and order, whatever your political color, we have to be lucky all of the time. They have to be, let's call it luck, they have to be lucky once. <clears throat> so rightly, as we celebrate the Good Friday Agreement, uh, the threat level has been raised. People need to keep an eye out. People need to keep a watch out. But let's be really clear. There's a lot to celebrate in this Good Friday Agreement. Sean, that's a, a very good summary. I, I, I might say that I make uh, documentaries about Irish history for uh, RTE, for the uh, Irish uh, station. And I would say that a theme of British policy towards Ireland for the last 100 years has been its neglect and uh, its ignorance. I don't think it's just something that's happened recently. Many thanks to you, Sean Woodward, and to Professor John Tung, and also uh, Doogie Beatty, who was uh, to storm on to a moment ago. Well, having assassinated Airy Neve MP, one of Margaret Thatcher's closest political allies, and Lord Mountbatten, the, uh, an uncle of King Charles III, the IRA planned to murder Margaret Thatcher, and maybe members of her cabinet too, by bombing the Grand Hotel in Brighton. Shortly before three in the morning on the 12th of October 1984, the device planted by Patrick McGee several weeks earlier exploded, bringing down part of the hotel roof and a chimney, killing five people and injuring 34. Still awake, having been at work on her speech for the following day at the Conservative Party conference, the Prime Minister had a lucky escape. Rory Carroll is the Irish correspondent for The Guardian and the author of the book Killing Thatcher, a detailed account of how the bombing was planned and how Patrick McGee was identified as the murderer, caught and convicted. And Rory joins me now. Rory, uh, welcome to GB News. Um, it's uh, a page turner of a book. Um, I might say that, of course, I remember these events very well. I was in Brighton that day. I feel I had a fairly lucky escape because I had left the bar of the Grand Hotel um, shortly before the bomb went off. And uh, one, of, one of the people killed there was uh, Sir Anthony Berry, the member for Enfield Southgate, and in a by-election uh, two months later, I took his seat in Parliament. So I feel a very strong uh, connection to these events, as well as having uh, been a great friend of uh, Margaret Thatcher. Tell us about the, um, the planning. I mean, this was a very sophisticated plot. And in particular, the security forces, as you point out in your book, had not realised the significance of these long-delay timing devices that enabled you to put a bomb into a room two months in advance. Yeah, well, good morning, Michael, and thank you for having me. And 
firstly, I'd like to say I'm struck by the fact that Sean Woodward, the quote he used about um, we have to be only lucky only once, yeah. was, of course, is the famous claim of the IRA responsibility for the Brighton operation. And the fact that that to this day, in a sense, kind of haunts the, the body politic is, is, is in itself very telling. Yeah, this operation, to use IRA terminology, was the most audacious, ambitious uh, operation of, of the entire Troubles. And it was started really up with the hunger strikes when Margaret Thatcher entered real demonology of Irish Republican history because she was deemed responsible, culpable for the deaths of 10 Irish Republican prisoners who starved themselves to death. So the IRA invested time, money and thought in scouting for years the successive Conservative Party conferences and sending out scouts and even then a construction engineer to survey the Grand Hotel's architecture. And then they then customized a bomb and a long delay timers. And then they sent over one of their best operators, Patrick McGee, who had grown up in England, who could put on a convincing English accent and who could affect kind of to be comfortable. And that was important because one of the, the last link in the chain was when he checked into the Grand Hotel three weeks before the Tory conference, um, posing as an Englishman, as a guest, he requested a sea-facing room, knowing that Thatcher would be given a sea-facing suite. And there he spent three days and three nights, more or less cloistered inside his room, assembling the bomb, concealing it uh, behind a bath panel in room 629. And then after three days, he just calmly checked out and walked away and disappeared leaving the bomb inside this room ticking, well, actually pulsing, and, and, and time to go off precisely at 2.54 a.m. on the last night of the Conservative conference. Uh, some of the most compelling images, of course, were not only the destruction of the hotel, but the attempt to remove uh, Norman Tebbit from the wreckage. Norman Tebbit, a senior member of the Conservative government at the time, uh, badly injured. Um, John Wakeham, the chief whip, also badly injured. Uh, John Wakeham's uh, wife died in the bombing. And Norman Tebbit's wife um, spent the re rest of her long lifetime uh, in a, a wheelchair. Um, so it was an extraordinarily well-planned operation. The one thing, I suppose, from Patrick McGee's point of view that went wrong was that as he signed into the hotel, and you had to sign a, a card in those days, he left, what, a palm print on the registration card. Is that right? That's right. And this is a, a crucial moment in the whole story and in the book. So much hinged on this moment when, of course, re remember, he had to appear very normal. He, could, he didn't want to attract the attention of the receptionist or do anything that would draw attention. So he couldn't be look too awkward. Um, but he did, as it turned out, fatefully, he did leave a, a fragment of a palm print on the registration card. And remarkably, uh, when three weeks later the bomb exploded and... Uh, and, and shredded the hotel in the rubble, right buried in the basement in steel cabinets. Their hotel registration cards were, were still there and the police were able to extract them. And that then led, it, it, it still took, I mean, a huge, the, the last kind of third of the book really is a police procedural where we follow the police in this pre-digital age where they need to, initially they had nothing, I mean, very little, virtually no intelligence about the who might have actually done it. I mean, they knew it was the IRA, but which operators, they didn't know. And so one of the key strands of the investigation was fingerprinting the registration cards. And in January 1985, it just took it took time. It took about three months. They made a match with this palm print with a one of the uh, uh, with the palm print in the in their files, which amazingly actually dated back to 1967 when a teenage Patrick McGee in Norwich, living there at the time, um, had been caught breaking into a butcher shop. And the very diligent um, coppers in, in Norwich not only took his fingerprints, also took the palm print of this teenage um, Pat McGee, and they remained on file. Of course, by 1984 and 85, he had a bulging file for other operations and explosions prior to Brighton, So, but it was part of the file. And they made that match. And so that's the moment when they knew that the Brighton bomber was Patrick McGee. Uh, Rory, it's, um, it's a page turner of a book. I, I don't know whether one should say that about a, a thing that is actually a work of non-fiction. 
Just tell me very, very, very briefly, why did you write it? Why did you think it was important? I stumbled across it in my day job when I heard that um, Patrick McGee was writing a memoir and Norman Tebbit was um, said that he had no desire to read it. And in my uh, so in reporting on this, I started diving into the story and I just what I thought was a very familiar story. I thought we all we all know what happened. Right. And in fact, it wasn't familiar to me. There's so much that had been either forgotten or never really fully known. And partly because, in a sense, there was the, the stiff upper lip of British society and Thatcher herself where I'd been, were so keen just to turn the page and move on. Because I think there was this feeling that to dwell on this would in itself give a victory to the IRA. And yeah. so, in a sense, history turned the page a bit too fast on an event that could have really changed you know, the, the country and, and the world and had... The, the, the bomb and the avalanche that descended on the Brighton uh, Hotel had it killed her. Yeah, I think it's a very accurate reflection. And of course, your book records, and maybe many people remember this, that the Conservative Party conference began the next morning on time, despite the fact that uh, people had been killed and many others injured in the Grand Hotel. Many thanks to you, Rory Carroll. Uh, your book, Killing Thatcher, is published on Tuesday. Uh, coming up, in the wake of the Jimmy Savile scandal exposed back in 2012, an inquiry into ch child sex abuse sat for seven years. Now the government promises action, but not quite yet. That's after the break. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit up. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We've got a brand new lineup every Saturday night on GB News. From 6 p.m., I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8 p.m. as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Brand new Saturday nights on GB News, Britain's news channel. Uh, welcome back. Um, 
As we approach the start of the new tax year, it's estimated that businesses in the United Kingdom will be hit with an extra £9 billion a year of taxes as the main rate of corporation tax increases from 19 to 25%. It comes at the same time as many companies face higher costs as government subsidies on energy bills are reduced or abolished. Many smaller businesses, often described as the engine of economic growth, will also suffer a cut to research and development tax reliefs from April. The net effect of those changes will raise about £18 billion a year for the Treasury. Martin McTagg is the chair of the Federation of Small Businesses, and he joins me now. Uh, Martin, thank you very much for uh, being on GB News. So how does the small business community feel about the start of the new tax year? I think it's one mainly of disappointment. It was since the uh, budget um, in uh, a couple of weeks ago, they've, they've been facing some really major choices. Um, the, the end of this, any kind of meaningful support on energy happened on the 1st of April, and that's put a lot of businesses in, in really difficult situation. I mean, I, I saw one the other day was a was a, a pub where their uh, energy costs had quadrupled. Um, they were paying an extra £60,000 a year. And under the current scheme, they were only going to get £900 reduction in that bill. So they were in a perilous position. And that's true of hundreds of thousands of additional businesses. So um, you said at the beginning, we need these businesses to be firing on all cylinders. And at the moment, they're not. For, for small businesses, I suppose the corporation tax rise is not as significant. But tell me about the loss of some of these um, exemptions and uh, allowances. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing was he had an opportunity to go back to the £250,000 allowance for, for the small business rate. And instead, he stuck with £50,000, mm. which is means that in effect almost all businesses will be paying the 25 percent rate and it's it it is i think a really big missed opportunity and then when you look at um the other factor which was his move on uh capital uh sorry uh, uh capital relief on uh or for for most full expensing doesn't really affect very many small businesses. It will have only have a minor impact. Could you just explain that to viewers? Because I'm not sure I quite grasp that. What is it you can okay. full expense? Well, what what this what has happened in the past is that when you increase corporation tax, normally the the uh, way of soothing the pain is to allow you to expense more capital gains. So if you if you are spending more on capital you can offset whatever tax bill you're likely to get. But for most small businesses, they're not in a position to take advantage of that because their restriction is the money available to invest in new capital projects. It isn't a question of tax relief. That's not the determining factor. Their biggest factor is, is the money available to invest? And is research and development an important consideration for your members? Yeah, R&D tax credits are vitally important. They are one of the most successful tax uh, developments in the last few years. And we were seeing significant increases in the investment in cutting edge technology. But what has happened since is that has been now effectively ruled out from almost all businesses. The, to give you one example, um, the government has announced that you have to have a 40% uh, rate of R&D tax intensity in the UK before you qualify for this relief. Mm. In Australia, it's only 2%. So it gives you some idea of how this is effectively only restricted to a tiny number of businesses. And it's a yeah. big disappointment at a time when you really want these businesses to invest. Uh, Martin McTague, you've made your case uh, very, very clearly and very, very calmly, all the more effective for that. Thanks for being with us today on GB News. Uh, coming up, in the wake of the Jimmy Savile scandal exposed in 2012, an inquiry into child sex abuse sat for seven years. 
Now the government promises action, but not quite yet. That's after the break. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you in whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7 p.m. Monday to Thursdays on Farage here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Welcome back. Uh, often on this programme, I talk to critic Stefan Kiriazis about what's going on on the theatre stages of London. In his absence, I'd like to report on Guys and Dolls, which he urged me to see at the Bridge Theatre opposite the Tower of London. The space there is absolutely versatile, and for this production, galleries of seats are arranged on four sides around an open space, and that area is shared by the cast and a standing audience as platforms are constantly but unpredictably rising out of the floor, those with standing tickets are marshalled by stagehands who are dressed as New York cops. And you may find yourself caught up in the action, ushered to a seat in a cafe or a cabaret, or mauled by one of the characters in the musical. Slick doesn't begin to sum up how smoothly the production copes with the pace and the innumerable changes in the location of the stage and to the spectators. For me, this 1950 musical is pretty mediocre material, but in this production it provides one of the greatest evenings of entertainment imaginable. I felt as though we had entered a new era of theatrical experience where the theatre-goer is absolutely immersed in the action. Uh, another great evening is available at the Lyric Theatre Hammersmith, and again, it's based on a very old script. The Italian playwright Dario Fo wrote the accidental death of an anarchist back in 1970. 
a character who's known only as the Maniac, enters a police station and induces the dim-witted officers to unravel how they pitched a suspect out of a high window and organise the cover-up. The story is updated by Tom Basden to London's Metropolitan Police today, and the maniac is played with frenetic and unflagging energy by Daniel Rigby, who's a highly gifted clown, complete with crazy costumes, wigs and athletic tumbles. You will laugh out loud almost without cease. As posing as a judge, he uncovers the police's stupidity, corruption and violence. The script is modernised to bring in Suella Braverman. Sarah Everard and her police killer Wayne Cousins, and the Mets serial rapist David Carrick. 1,850 people have died in police custody in the United Kingdom since 1990, with only two convictions for manslaughter, the play tells us. There's just one moment when the laughter stops and the maniac delivers a blistering indictment of our capital's police force. As a Tory, I hardly expected to find myself joining in the deafening applause, but I did. And the audience reaction made me think that there's no saving the Metropolitan Police. Maybe it has to be chucked out of the window and a new start made. From the theatre to music, the organ is one of the most complex instruments comprising pipes, foot pedals, stops and multiple keyboards. It dates back 2,000 years, with the Greeks credited with its invention. Pipes may vary from 10 metres long to less than 2.5 centimetres, which gives the organ a possible range of nine octaves, which is larger than any other musical instrument. Organs are strongly associated with churches, of course, but film music, especially that of the composer Hans Zimmer, has brought the organ into popular conscience. Friend of the programme, Julian Lloyd Webber, met a star of classical music who uses social media to share her spectacular virtuosity of the instrument. in Pembroke College Chapel and this was built 1665 is that right? Yes consecrated in 1665 Amazing. with an organ from 1710 originally. I mean that's Bach was alive then. I and know. It's extraordinary isn't it? And you sit there playing Bach on it and you think oh my god yes. it's incredible. And I have to kind of pinch myself that this is the office it's a bit extraordinary isn't it? <laughs> Lovely office you got. It's not bad it's got it's some nice views uh, but yeah so I work here uh, several times a week. I have two choirs that I work with here we've got a chapel choir made up of undergraduates and postgrads and we've got a girls choir for girls aged 11 to 18 which gives them uh, free music education essentially that's for girls from the local area. So important. It really really important and it's a amazing to see the power of choral music and music more generally to really transform young people, whether that is someone who's starting at 11 or someone who's starting as an undergraduate. So you are so busy at the moment and I have to say your rise in classical music has just been meteoric. Oh. It really has. <laughs> you, you can't deny it. It's been a bit of an extraordinary uh, couple of years, yeah. I have to keep sort of pinching myself and reminding myself that it's actually happening. So you were the first music director at any Oxbridge Music College, I mean the youngest. The youngest, yeah, and so I think I was the youngest when I arrived, and I think I'm still either the youngest or the second youngest But now. I mean, when you first came, by about ten years, wasn't it? Yeah. It wasn't just slightly younger. Yeah, so I got the job um, just after I'd finished my undergrad uh, in Oxford, and I was sort of thinking, gosh, I have no idea what I'm going to do with my life. And then this job came up, and I thought, well, there's no way I'll get it, but I may as well try But and see. so much has been happening. I mean, I think you have the keys to the Albert Hall, don't you? I Your do. associate <laughs> organist or so associate... Musician. Associate artist. So there, are, there are four of us. So can you literally go in there and practice any time you want when they're not when there's not a concert or something? It's not quite any time. It's uh, we have pre-organised time. So I go in roughly once a month. I'm actually going in tonight, um, mm. and it's sort of eleven till six in the morning. Which brings me to the social media. 
because there's lots of clips of you at 5.30 in the morning, one of you actually playing My Brother's Phantom, the opera, uh, which I just watched this morning. It's brilliant. <laughs> um, but, I mean, you seem to be in there at 5.30 in the middle of the night. Yeah, so that's my slot. The organ slot at the Albert Hall, so that we're not disturbing anything else, uh, is 11 till 6 in the morning. So 11 that's at night till amazing. 6 in the morning. And it's amazing. I mean, you know what these iconic venues are like after hours. Yeah. You feel like Some it's nice strange and creaking going on. Yeah. It's a, a and the, the cleaners are there and the crew will shout up requests. They must love it. Oh, they, they do. They say, actually, if they're on a long shift and so there's organ music going on, it makes it much more But when fun. you're in the middle of practising, then it's a bit of an inconvenience to be asked to play Star Wars or something. I love it. I mean, if you're having to practise at that time of night, you need something yeah, maybe you do. to kind of give you a bit yes. of a lift and make you smile. And... You know, to icing on the cake, you've just been signed by Sony. Mm. Um, have you released something yet? Yes, we're in the middle of releasing our first EP at the moment, so that's Midnight Sessions at the Royal Albert Hall. Wow. And it's basically all the film covers that I've been writing in my practice sessions and playing with the really kind of spooky sounds that that organ has, the bells and the strings and uh, all, all sorts of things you wouldn't expect and to hear. You can use that acoustic, can't you? Because it's so resonant. It is, particularly when no one's in there. Yeah. Uh, and there's something about any venue in, in the middle of the night, but that one in particular, and we've tried to capture that magic on the recording, and I hope we've managed to Got to hear this. Got yeah. to hear it. So you're very active on social media. Um, I've, I've seen you, you've got accounts on... TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, yeah. and loads of people following you. Yes, you've got over half a million on, on TikTok. It's mad, isn't it? I mean, those numbers are just not numbers that we would necessarily associate with classical music and in organist, inverted commas. Yeah. And organist, yeah. yeah. I, but what I've loved discovering is that actually social media is a place where people really enjoy seeing people talk passionately about the thing that they love. Yeah. But it's also been amazing for me, the process of thinking, how can I view this instrument differently? How can I take film music or more familiar music from video games and put it on this instrument to help bring it to a wider audience? And it's massively opened my horizons yeah, too. Yeah, and I mean, it is really bringing, it's what we all want to do, bringing music to as many people as possible in, in, in different ways, really. Yeah, and I might, the uh, sort of thing I always say to myself is, we are all saying we want to bring young people into the music world, yeah. whether that's classical music or other, other genres. And where do they spend most of their time? On social media exactly. so let's make sure that they can stumble across classical music as part of their daily activity can't believe really the organ was built in 1710 yeah it's been tweaked a little bit over the years but some of the 1710 pipe work still exists do you want to come and have a go yeah <laughs> Please show me Let's hear some of the different stops on the organ, the different sounds. Yeah, so if we start at the really, really soft end, which I actually adore, we have these beautiful little flutes. So we've got an eight-foot flute, which means sort of piano pitch, mm -hmm. which sounds like this. But then we've got one an octave higher. They're very individual sounds, aren't they? They are. And then when you start mixing them together, that's when you start getting more like the sort of sound you would associate with the organ. So if I just hold down this one note, mm -hmm. but then start adding more stops, so adding more pipes, you hear that the sound starts to get more intense. And then... We're starting to get to organ territory, right? Let's so then get it, the trumpet. Yeah, if I start, if I add the trumpet to the top. Oh yeah. And then that's where pulling out the stops comes from. It comes from the organ. When you pull, the more stops you pull out, the louder it gets, yeah. basically. So if we have almost everything, but not quite everything, it sounds like this. You must feel so powerful with that. It's quite cool. And it's surround sound, right? Yeah. It's, it's an exciting thing. So you've got a, another keyboard down here, really, haven't you? For, for your feet. Yeah, so we wear special shoes when we play the organ, and this is so that we can move uh, sort of properly over the pedals. And we don't just play bass notes, we play full melodies. So if you're playing some Bach, you might get something like this. <laughs> starts when you then put that with yep, full hands so then it would sound like this The 
one pleads instruments, isn't it's it? It's cool, isn't it? It's, yeah. I always say that if you want to get fit, play the organ. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Anna. I mean, it's really fascinating. And uh, you, you told us this organ was originally built in 1710 when, of course, Bach was alive. So would you play us out with that famous toccata? <laughs> I think this is my most requested thing. Yeah, Must of course, be. of course. <laughs> The uh, magnificent sound of the organ at Pembroke College, Cambridge. Thanks to Julian Lloyd Webber and to Anna Lapwood. And you can find Anna on social media. It's been, uh, uh, you can find her on TikTok and, ooh, I think most things actually. And you put in her name, Anna Lapwood, on Instagram and you put organ and you will find her. Uh, it's been another night of frustration for many travellers heading to the port of Dover. Uh, coach passengers in particular. Uh, arriving at Dover for the Easter getaway face lengthy waits despite extra ferries being laid on overnight to clear the backlog. The port is estimating waits of between six and eight hours for coach passengers, depending on the ferry operator. The cause of the delays is being blamed on the slower boarding processing and a higher than expected number of coaches. The port has declared a critical incident. GB News reporter Theo Chacomba is at Dover and we can speak to him. Uh, Theo, hello. What is the present situation? Yes, good morning. It's yet another day of queues for people who are coming here. So there's lorries, cars uh, and coaches as well. People trying to get across um, into Calais from here in Dover. But since Friday, there's been a backlog. And um, this morning, lorries are running slightly smoother than they have been in the last few days. But it is the coaches who've had problems uh, for the last few days. One coach apparently at the very front of the queue has been there for around 15 hours and it hasn't moved. I've been here since the early hours of the morning. Those coaches, school children who are um, going abroad haven't been able to move at all. And this is because of the boarding process, but of course, um, backlog as well. They weren't expecting uh, this many coaches to come here. So it is a long, frustrating way. You are seeing some people who are walking from uh, inside the port of Dover here um, and walking towards the town centre. And of course, um, we don't know how long this is going to last for, but they are being reassured that things are are running smoothly, more ferries um, being put on so that they can uh, travel as they need to. When I was looking at the um, coverage of this earlier, there were a lot of people who'd got off the coaches, I suppose, temporarily. And it was evident that many of those people were in school uniforms. These were school kids. And it really is deeply, deeply frustrating and deeply cruel, is it not, that so many children are caught up in this. It is, yeah. A lot of them have been waving at us, actually. And the ones who are sitting just outside of their coaches, they've come out of their coaches uh, sitting outside, waiting to be told when their coach can be moving. A lot of them will have been looking forward to this, as this, of course, the Easter break, um, getting away uh, for those uh, holidays. And, of course, they're now stuck in this traffic, many of them having to sit here for hours upon hours. So when they'll be able to move, it's not quite clear yet. But at the moment, the coaches are completely standing still. And it's only the lorries and some cars uh, which are going through smoothly as well. Um, Theo, in the introduction a moment ago I said that some people were blaming the higher than anticipated numbers of coaches I suppose but I think a lot of viewers will find that quite hard to understand. Um, surely with an Easter holiday uh, surely many of these coaches have made bookings. I would have thought that the number could be fairly easily anticipated. What's your view on that? You're right. Well, to be honest, um, Easter holidays aren't a new thing. They happen every single year. You'd expect the management here to be prepared for situations like this, but they've found themselves in this situation where people are queuing up for hours upon hours, and they are beginning to be frustrated, particularly lorries are the ones who are going through, and cars as well. Um, they are having an easier time, but it's those people, particularly on coaches, who are having a hard time, and they're having to wait here um, outside of their coaches, not knowing when they'll be able to get on a ferry. 
Mm, of course, the question of Brexit creeps in here. I was a supporter of Brexit. But Simon Calder, speaking on GB News earlier, was saying that it was the British who had wanted to introduce a system where passports would be stamped going into the European Union. You'd think, actually, the government might be repenting of that decision if Simon had that right. Well, of course, this will be something that's going to be mentioned in debates over the next few days about what this system is like at the moment, what changes should be implemented to make it more efficient. Whether it is at the moment or not, politically speaking, um, that's something that's going to be, have to be discussed over the next few days. And, of course, working and speaking with the management here, that's something they're going to have to address so that situations like this don't continue to creep up. Of course, as more people begin to travel over the next few days, uh, that is one concern they'll have uh, as they come here to the port of Dover, attempting to get to Calais. And Theo, if you were a betting man, where would you say that the coaches will be moving smoothly? Oh, if I was a betting man, uh, probably 6 p.m. this evening, maybe. Um, but at the moment, they haven't moved at all. So it's hard to predict exactly when they'll start moving. But if we do see any sight of that, we'll bring it here on GB News uh, straight away. Yes, thank you indeed, uh, Theo Chikomba. Um, they've been saying all day that this is going to be cleared up, and now he's just talking about 6 p.m. We'll certainly keep you up to date with the situation on GB News throughout the day. Well, coming up, more Sunday conversation, including when does art become pornography and a taste of Easter eggs. All of that will come after the weather. See you then. Hello, I'm Craig Snow and here is your latest forecast from the Metal West. Well, for most of us, it's the next few days, it's going to be dry. Best of the sunshine always across the south, but for all of us, still the risk of some frosty nights. So here's the situation, the bigger picture. Got this area of high pressure beginning to build in across the British Isles and that will start to settle things down and relatively dry. Fronts across the north will always just give the risk still of the odd spot of rain. And really that's the situation as we go through the course of this afternoon. Best of the sunshine across the east and eventually into central parts too. But elsewhere, quite a bit of cloud around and that cloud across the north may just be thick enough at times to produce the odd shower. Temperatures from many in the sunshine reaching 13 to 14 degrees, but where that cloud remains, especially across eastern Scotland, feeling pretty chilly, especially in the breeze. Into the evening, and what we see is the clearer skies begin to work their way a little bit further westward. So a lot of England, Wales, and eventually into Scotland, a dry, clear night to come. But the cloud may well just continue to linger on across Northern Ireland. And with a subly breeze here, actually temperatures not fully much lower than five to six degrees. But elsewhere, especially in the countryside, we will see a touch of frost. But that will give us a lovely start to the new working week. Lots of sunshine after that frost lifts across England, Scotland and Wales. But once again, Northern Ireland hanging on to a little bit more cloud. And with that breeze coming in, just feeling a little bit chilly here from time to time. But elsewhere in the sunshine, feeling very pleasant for the time of year. Temperatures reaching around 13, 14, possibly even 15 degrees in a few spots. Into the evening, very little changes. We may well just see some thicker cloud and maybe the odd splash of rain reaching the very far west of Northern Ireland. But for most of the country, another dry, clear and potentially frosty night as we head into Tuesday. And in Tuesday, we will then start to see some cloud move in across the northwest and that will eventually spread some rain across many parts of the UK as we go into the middle of the week. Join me, Gloria Di Piero, Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. We've got three brilliant interviews for you this Sunday. We've got the first woman to chair the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. It's the Conservative MP, Alicia Cairns. So the reality is we are under attack from authoritarian states on every single day. Also, the Conservative MP, who's leaving at the next election, Charles Walker. But we do need, I don't think we attract the really big thinkers we attracted in the past. And the leader of Britain's biggest trade union, Christina McInerney. Nobody wants the, the business that their members are in to fail. You want it to succeed. All that and more. Gloria Meets, Sunday, 6pm. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel.
Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon and welcome to the second hour of Sunday with Michael Portillo with more conversation, arts and entertainment. Coming up from the ancient to the modern, the Stone of Schoon, also known as the Stone of Destiny, will be travelling from Scotland for the King's coronation. Why is this historic block of sandstone so important? And after giants of the technology industry call for a temporary halt in the development of artificial intelligence, should we worry about this potentially dangerous technology? And this time next week, you might already be tucking into an Easter egg. I'll be smashing into the best chocolate shells. That will be breaking news. That's all after the news summary with Tatiana Sanchez. Michael, thank you very much. This is the latest from the GB newsroom. The port of Dover has run extra ferry services overnight to try and clear a backlog which has seen passengers delayed for up to 14 hours. The port declared a critical incident yesterday as traffic built up from the Easter getaway with coaches at the cruise terminal facing the longest waits. Ferry services have cited bad weather and hold-ups at French border control with the port saying additional coach bookings had impacted operations. The Home Secretary is to introduce new measures to tackle child sexual abuse. Writing in the Mail on Sunday, Swella Bravman has announced those working with children will have a legal duty to report signs or suspicions of sexual abuse. It follows an independent inquiry last year which described sexual abuse of children as an epidemic. 
Three British men are being held in Taliban custody in Afghanistan. They include the so-called danger tourist Miles Routledge, who had to be rescued from Kabul by British forces less than two years ago. A humanitarian network that's assisting two of the men says it believes they're in good health and are being treated well. The Foreign Office says it's working hard to make contact with both of them. Anthony Joshua has won his heavyweight fight against Jermaine Franklin. The British boxing champion put in a somewhat laboured display at the O2 Arena in London last night, securing a unanimous points victory in 12 rounds. It's Joshua's first time back in the ring since losing to Alexander Usyk last August, earning him his 25th professional win. Well, after the fight, he said a battle of Britain with Tyson Fury is now the fight the boxing world needs. What can I say? It's, a, it's an honour to win, of course. That's what we train for. But let's say a fight I'm loses. He has to just rebuild and come again. I'm going to stop putting that amount of pressure on myself and just work hard and do my best. That's all I can do. Now. And the Pope has led a Palm Sunday service in Rome a day after being sent home from hospital with bronchitis. Around 30,000 people came to watch Pope Francis opening Easter celebrations, which mark the start of Holy Week. The 86-year-old was driven to St Peter's Square in Vatican City sitting in the back of an open-topped car passing through the crowds. The Pope was taken to hospital on Wednesday, complaining of breathing difficulties, but he returned home to the Vatican yesterday. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now, though, it is back to Michael. Thank you, Tatiana Sanchez. The government will legislate to implement a recommendation from an independent inquiry to make it mandatory for people who work with children to report accusations of child sexual abuse or face punishment. The independent inquiry into child sexual abuse set up in the wake of the Jimmy Savile scandal, which came to light in 2012, published its final report last October. The £186.6 million inquiry started work in 2015 and scrutinised institutional responses to child sexual abuse, including in Westminster and in the church. It lasted seven years and heard from more than 7,000 victims. It also called for a compensation scheme for victims. The inquiry depicted the issue as a global crisis and called for urgent action, or more children would be at risk. Sarah Dines, MP, is the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Safeguarding and joins me now. Uh, hello and welcome to GB News. Um, it seems to me that we knew an awful lot of what had gone wrong back in 2012 when the Jimmy Savile case came to light. And that's now uh, 11 years ago. The government is now contemplating legislation. How would you explain this very long gap of time? <laughs> Well, the actual inquiry took over seven years and it was a very important inquiry. And the more it delved, the more it found. And thousands of victims of sexual abuse were able to give very heart-wrenching testimony about what had happened to them. But it's really important, although it's taken a long time, it's really important to get our response right. And the government is working hard on this. We, this is a scourge in our society. And what the report found, what the inquiry found, mm. is that it's in all sorts of parts of our society. And frankly, we've got to stamp it out. So I am proud that the government is taking this action today with a, with a new change of law in mandatory reporting, which was a key recommendation of the report. Um, uh, I don't believe you're taking action today, are you? You're starting a process of consultation that will lead towards legislation. Well, we've indicated quite clearly that we are going to be making it mandatory for those that are in positions of power, like teachers, social workers and volunteers that work with children, to make sure that they do disclose what's happened to the police. And what we're doing is consulting. We're going to consult immediately with professionals in the field to get the right scheme, which will be a legal mandatory reporting um, uh, obligation. It's quite revolutionary and it is, uh, needs some thought, but we are working on it fast. To go to the uh, other end of the problem, we, we all know about the uh, Carl Beach case, that is to say, a case where false accusations were made against prominent people. How will you safeguard uh, against children, maybe, or uh, people who were abused when they were children, making malicious charges in order to discredit people? How will you 
know whether that's going on because, as I understand, you're putting an obligation on people to report, not to use their judgment. It's not an obligation to sanction. It's an obligation to report. And the properly trained professionals will look at each and every allegation very, very carefully. And occasionally one does get false reports, but you get that with any offence. But we can't stop in making sure that people are protected. Children are the most vulnerable part of our society, as well as the elderly. We must make sure that they're not sexually abused. So I don't accept we're going to be rife with false reports. There may be one or two, and they will be dealt with and identified. The overwhelming people that gave evidence are speaking the truth to the inquiry, and it was very heartbreaking testimony. We need to act. And does this only apply within professional settings? In other words, for, let's take an example of someone who discovers that a family member is involved in a crime against children. Does that person have an obligation to report the crime to the police? What's being looked at at the moment is people that work professionally and people that volunteer with children. And obviously, if something is with, hidden within a community or a, in a family, it's very much harder to get to the truth. But the actual fine-tuning of exactly how the system works is being worked on at this minute. If I could also just mention something else, Michael, what we are doing, which is instant, is the government is giving £600,000 to the NSPCC for a whistleblower's helpline where people will be able to phone up that work for organisations where previously they didn't really, they were uncertain as to, to what to do, but they're going to be able to speak to professionals at the NSPCC, employees, that's really important. We're also giving extra funding to the NSPCC for their other helplines. We are doing a lot in this area. I suppose that could also have been done in the last 11 years. But many thanks. Sarah Dines, MP, uh, the safeguarding minister. Thanks for being on GB News. Um, five years ago, Conservative Chancellor Anthony Barber introduced value-added tax, or VAT. It replaced purchase tax and put the United Kingdom in line with the European Economic Community. In the last five decades, VAT in Britain has gone from 8% to 20 and the percentage of government tax that it raises has almost doubled from 7% to over 13. However, a vast range of goods and services are not taxed, including food and transport. Not surprisingly, there have been controversies over what should be covered, and after a campaign, sanitary showers, as an example, were removed from the tax's scope. Supporters of VAT say it's the fairest tax, since many essentials are tax-free, and in theory at least you can choose what to buy. Critics point out that, nonetheless, people on lower incomes pay a larger percentage of their income in VAT. Uh, Harry Wallop is a consumer journalist, and Elliot Keck is from the Taxpayers' Alliance, and they both join me now. Um, Elliot, first of all, um, is this, as taxes go, a good tax? Well, all taxes are bad, but they're not all bad in the same way. Uh, and VAT, as it goes, is, is one of the uh, most efficient or at least the least inefficient taxes because rather than taxing our incomes, our savings and our investments, it, it taxes the, the products that we buy. So it, it is one of the least uh, economically damaging taxes as taxes go. And the word value added is quite important in this because um, if you're filling out your form, you can claim back the VAT that you've had to pay to other people mm -hmm. as part of your business. I do a VAT form, so I go through this process each month. Uh, and, and, and that seems quite well judged, quite well thought through. Yes, and, and, and that's very interesting. And, and it's, uh, it's different to a sales tax, which is what we had before, where things are only taxed right at the end of the line. VAT is taxed at each stage. But it's really interesting because that brings up one of the problems with the VAT, actually, which is that there are many businesses that, for example, a charity where they're not allowed to add VAT to the products that they sell, but often they're um, charge VAT on the products that they buy. So if you're a charity bookshop and you buy a new bookcase, you have to pay VAT on that. But the products that you sell from that bookcase, you're then not allowed to add VAT onto. So that just opens up the uh, Pandora's box of problems with the different exemptions within VAT. Harry, I don't know whether you've got these things in your mind, but there have been many famous controversies during the history of VAT in this country. And several times, a Chancellor of the Exchequer has come a cropper. Uh, I think of, now what was it? Uh, was it pasties from from Craig's, which was a disaster, I think, for George Osborne. Yeah, it was the famous <laughs> Omni Shambles. <laughs> the uh, Omni Shambles. Shambles budget, yes. Whether it was a hot food uh, or whether it wasn't hot food. I think, in fact, he was trying uh, to close the loophole on rotisserie chickens. That was the <laughs> main concern for the Tory government at the time. And they were unaware that it was going to completely clobber Greg's and all other pasty shops. Uh, essentially, hot food uh, is, uh, is vatable uh, and uh, cold food is not. And it all comes back to essentially when they drew up the rules in the 1970s, 
as a general guiding principle, food is exempt from fat. It's a staple good, but luxuries are not. You get these crazy anomalies of whether a biscuit is chocolate covered or not chocolate covered. And also, which I've never quite got my head around, cake is considered a staple. That's a necessity. So cake is free of VAT, and therefore we get to the famous Jaffa cake incident. Is Jaffa cake a chocolate covered biscuit, which is a luxury, or is it a cake? And after many, many years and a lot of expensive legal bills, it was finally decided that Jaffa cakes were indeed cakes because they go, s they go hard when they go stale rather than going soggy, which is what a biscuit does. <laughs> it's all back to uh, Marie uh, Antoinette, I, I, I think. What, what was the importance of aligning with the um, European economic community? And is it still important to us today to be aligned with the European Union? Well, uh, aligning with the uh, um, European economic community was important within the context of a single market because it meant that... Uh, com uh, countries weren't able to essentially effectively subsidise different products by uh, putting artificially low uh, uh, tax rates on products that they sell relative to another country. Um, now that we're out of the EU, I think it's in entirely fine to experiment with some things. But what I'd say is that VAT is one of those taxes that in relative terms does actually work and I wouldn't want to meddle with it too much unless it was serious and substantial reform. Harry, I used to be a Treasury Minister and I've had it very frustrating that VAT applied probably only to about 50% of goods and services um, by value. But you might argue, on the other hand, that it's having quite a deleterious effect on people with low incomes. Do you want to make that point? Well, I mean, I mean yes, it is, in theory, a, a, a regressive tax. What you do is you get a lot of, um, sort of interested parties lobbying for their particular goods to be zero rated. So the famous one is things like, e well, tampon tax, which we've mentioned, but also e-books. So books were VAT free, but e-books were not because they're electronic item. But they won. So if we take the publishers, they won the row over e-books. So that should have helped consumers, that they could buy e-books ch more cheaply. But the price of e-books did not fall. And in fact, mm. there's been some research on tampons and sanitary products. The price of those only fell by 1%. So when you get all these interested parties lobbying, for zero rated tax, it tends to help the companies improve their profits, but doesn't really help consumers who should expect cheaper goods. And of course, ministers always wanted to put VAT on newspapers, but uh, never, never absolutely dared to do that. Elliot, does it make a big difference now that it's 20%? I mean, is there a level at which this tax doesn't work? Is 20% the tops? I, I think Spain has 21% as one mm. of its rates. Well, I mean, listen, we have a tax burden that's at a 70-year high, so we would oppose increasing taxes really across the board, and 20% is is one of the high, uh, higher levels um, uh, across across the world. So I, I certainly wouldn't like to see any increase in VAT, but whether or not, if you were going to cut taxes, whether or not VAT would be the right one to cut when there's so many others that you could look at, whether it's corporation tax, income tax, I, I, would, I would hesitate to say that it would be the first one that we should look at. Harry, do you think the campaign is going to go on about this? Um, because, of course, the, the, there's not only the question about whether you take it out of the tax, there's also a question about whether you levy a differential rate. Um, energy is a differential rate, yeah. isn't it? So do you think these debates are going to go on and on? I'm sure, because, you know, everyone wants to pay less money to the Treasury, so everyone's going to fight for their slice of the cake or their slice of the Jaffa cake. And, by the way, the Treasury kind of opened up a front against itself here by cutting VAT on uh, restaurants, um, in order to stimulate trade immediately after the first wave of the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, it's a very easy lever to pull. Uh, it's very quick. Everyone sort of understands it. Uh, and, 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 it and it's also very, very difficult to dodge. So it's, it, that, in that sense, it is a good tax. Uh, I mean, one of the issues, of course, is, is the, which businesses start, at what level they start to pay VAT, and it's £85,000. So there is a theory that all sorts of entrepreneurs, little small businesses, things like holiday lets, um, throttle themselves. They stop expanding when they hit the 85,000 level because, oh my gosh, they're going to have to start paying VAT. They have to, you know, pass it on to their customers. So this has this cliff edge effect uh, whereby lots of businesses basically stop expanding. So should it maybe be at a lower level? Everyone pays VAT. All small businesses rather than just medium-sized businesses. Well, I can think of a lot of people who, who will not thank you for that <laughs> particular proposal. But uh, spe speaking as a former Treasury Minister, a tax that is very hard to avoid with easy levers that you can pull sounds absolutely marvellous. <laughs> Thanks to uh, Harry Wallop and uh, Elliot uh, Keck. Um, coming up, uh, sackings, social media trolling and accusations of failing to protect children, all because of Michelangelo's Statue of David. Is it great art or, as a group of American parents claims, just pornography? That's after the break.
It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Curve. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Curve. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. Uh, but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. We've got a brand new lineup every Saturday night on GB News. From 6 p.m., I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8 p.m. as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Brand new Saturday nights on GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It was supposed to be a routine class to teach Renaissance art at Tallahassee Classical School in Florida, but it resulted in the resignation of the principal, Hope Karaskelia, after three parents complained that the lesson included a photo of Michelangelo's nude statue of David. The sculpture, one of the best-known achievements of Western art, depicts the biblical David going to fight Goliath, armed only with a sling and clothed only in his faith in God. Certainly what we see is the perfect body of a young male. The board of the charter school asked for the principal's resignation after the parents claimed that they weren't notified that a nude would be shown, with one parent calling the statue pornographic. In a moment, we'll talk to art critic JJ Charlesworth. But first, let's go to Florence and talk to Cecilia Holberg, director of the Galleria dell'Accademia, where David stands 17 foot tall. Cecilia, hello. Welcome to GB News. Um, I believe you've invited the parents... Hello. You've invited the parents and the class to come to see the statue in Florence. Is that right? And why? Yes, I invited them, and I think that it would be very nice if you would come too and explain what you've said now to... to... <laughs> in the people in what what this statue means. I invited them because it's it's so sad to to know that there is such a big ignorance and ignorance can be cured if you explain people the things in the right way. And that's and even if they see the beauty, you know, um, nudity is not at all pornography. You have to have a strange fantasy to think this 
and at the same time the david you know it's 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 the icon of the renaissance because this is really um the young shepherd he is nude because his innocent his pureness is shown by his nudity and, and this is really important to know he has nothing of aggressive he has not like the other ones before him all david's before him they had the kind of, of bloody head of Goliath and showing this to, to the people. But our David is really pure and innocent and clean and in this white marble from Carrara. And as you said, this is the biblical um, figure with his faith in God and he wants to fight against uh, against uh, the enemies to to get f his own people free and this is so important all this message behind and not knowing this means to ignore the whole western culture ah but going into western culture if if, if i recall correctly for example king philip ii of spain commissioned tiziano titian to paint him some uh, canvases of ovid's metamorphoses uh, and these are quite violent pictures and they have a great deal of female nudity in them. And one can suppose that King Philip II was quite stimulated by this nudity. So um, do the parents in Florida have a point that actually some of these pieces were commissioned with the artists uh, fully aware of their sexual content? No, I think they just, um, they just don't know. They just ignore um the, the art history because they they maybe they did never see this david and this is really sad and that's the point it's important to know things um and if you have a renaissance class you have to show the david because it's 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 the middle of the renaissance the center the central figure of the renaissance representation of the perfect human being uh, put in the in the center of the of the attention this is really the renaissance and um the man was um, created um after the the example of uh, of god you know this is really an, an important message they have to learn um, Cecilia Holberg from the Galleria dell'Accademia in Florence. Thank you very much, and maybe I will indeed see you there. That would be a great pleasure. Thanks for being on, JB, uh, on GB News. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. So JJ Charlesworth is with me. Um, what, 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 what did you uh, make of the argument that, that I was using just there? That actually there, wa there, there was sex in some of this art. Those who were commissioning it were quite interested in sex. And, and by the way, very often the artists were involved with their models, whether male or female. So what about that? What about going to the origins of how this art was generated? Well, I, I don't know if you can uh, uh, determine what Michelangelo was thinking when he was sculpting David, but uh, I think there is uh, more of an issue here about who gets to see what and at mm. what age. I think this story is really to do with uh, whether uh, a culture or society or uh, has uh, an issue with who gets to see nude figures uh, in art uh, and uh, depending on what age. I mean, obviously, our, our society, you know, British society has not always been so liberal uh, when it comes to being uh, relaxed about nudity in art. Uh, the Victorians were uh, really good at putting fig leaves on, <laughs> on nude uh, Greco-Roman sculptures um, uh, because they thought it indecent and that has changed over time. I think here there is a uh, a bit of a distinction to be made uh, clearly between what is uh, taken to be pornographic, uh, which is explicit and usually explicit about sex, and, and things that might arouse you because uh, they're, they're naked bodies. But I think here really the issue is actually uh, whether parents uh, get to decide or understand what it is that is being taught. I think this story really does kind of uh, uh, turn on precisely what age uh, a school, a teacher might, might uh, broach these kinds of work. Yes, and I don't know the answer in this particular question. But who is to be the arbiter of this? Because I, I can see how some people would mount an anti-elitist argument here. They would say, well, you know, toffs and educated people tell us that this is not pornography, but then the stuff that we enjoy, they tell us, is pornography. And I guess there, there must be a spectrum. I mean, a tasteful sex scene in, in a high-budget movie uh, I suppose you would say that's not pornography. But if it weren't 
in that context, you might think it was. So there, there must be a spectrum here, mustn't there? There's de I mean, obviously, there's definitely a spectrum in... I think, you know, the way we tend to deal it with it in our, our contemporary culture is, is whether it's explicit or not, explicit or not. Uh, and that tends to be what people understand to be the difference between, say, soft porn or, or hard porn. But, um, but some art is, is fairly explicit. I was talking yes, about Ovid's uh, metamorphosis, yeah. you know, the rape of Europa and all that sort of thing. Quite a lot of rape in, in um, yes. Baseline's art. Yes, and also, I mean, obviously there's a gr great deal of, uh, say, 19th century symbolist art and decadent art, which is uh, very close to the, the, the bone on uh, when it comes to whether it's pornographic or not. I mean, and in, in fact, a lot of art was often made in private, uh, not to be seen in public. So there is, there is an issue of what is appropriate uh, 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 to be shown in public. And I think also here, what's really interesting about this, this story is that it's happening in a school uh, in Florida at the moment uh, at which there's a huge kind of cultural debate, you could even call it culture war, over what is to be taught over education and what children are supposed to be taught at what age. So I think that there is um, uh, an important point there which is being missed in this story, which is that there is some kind of uh, there is a tension between how uh, parents feel yeah. they have a responsibility to, to to kind of guide what their children see and a school. I mean, the, the biggest yeah. irony, though, um, it, we're having that debate here. Yeah. Of course, we had it the other day, didn't we, about whether if children apparently are changing gender, the parents should be informed. Um, uh, there is that. So, so, I mean, this in a way is that you know should should the arbiters here be the teachers? Or should the families have a say in what children are seeing in schools? I think that, that what we have to deal with at the moment is a, quite a big problem with a lack of trust yeah. between uh, what parents think should be taught and whether they can trust that teachers uh, and the educational establishment mm. is on the same wavelength. I think what's very uh, interesting about this story, however, is that this is a, uh, a charter school, like a, a, a school which is equivalent to, say, an academy, school academy in the UK. It's a charter school which is also following this uh, classical uh, 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 curriculum, which has a big emphasis on uh, the classical Western tradition in mm. terms of literature, art, science, and, and, and so on. And so it's quite ironic because actually Actually, it's sixth grade, 11, 12 year olds. I was, you know, it's quite interesting to kind of research this story a bit more because you discover that actually at age 11, 12, children are, read, are, are studying classical art, Gothic art, uh, the Renaissance and the Baroque. Now, for me, uh, you know, when I was at, at school when I was 12, in fact, for the whole of my uh, school years, I never came across that much art history. Uh, and this is something that ironically, you know, it's quite sad in a way because actually teachers in uh, teaching this curriculum uh, seem to be keen on giving uh, children a, a sense of uh, European art, uh, Western art, and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a rooting in the in the classics. Yeah, I was very struck that it was the Tallahassee Classical School. I'd never, yes. I'd never seen a, a, a school in the United States described as a classical school. Um, thanks to JJ Charlesworth and earlier to Cecilia Holberg. Uh, coming up with uh, preparations in full swing for the King's coronation, why an ancient block of sandstone will play a key role. That's after the news headlines with Tatiana Sanchez. Michael, thank you very much and good afternoon. It's 12.30. I'm Tatiana Sanchez in the GB newsroom. The port of Dover has run extra ferry services overnight to try to clear a backlog which has seen passengers delayed for up to 14 hours. It declared a critical incident yesterday as traffic built up from the Easter holiday getaway. The port says extra coach bookings had impacted operations as well as bad weather and hold-ups at French border control. The Home Secretary is to introduce new measures to tackle child sexual abuse. Writing in the Mail on Sunday, Swella Bravman has announced those working with children will have a legal duty to report signs or suspicions of sexual abuse. It follows an independent inquiry last year which described sexual abuse of children as an epidemic. Three British men are being held in Taliban custody in Afghanistan. They include the so-called danger tourist Mars Routledge, who had to be rescued from Kabul by British forces less than two years ago. A humanitarian network assisting the two men says it believes they're in good health and are being treated well. And the Pope has led a Palm Sunday service in Rome, a day after being sent home from hospital with bronchitis. Around 30,000 people came to watch Pope Francis driven to St Peter's Square in the Vatican City. 
TV online, DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn. This is GB News. Now it's back to Michael. Uh, thank you, Tatiana Sanchez. It seemed that a united view had emerged from the titans of the technology sector, a letter signed by such key figures as Elon Musk and Apple's co-founder Steve Wozniak, called for a six-month moratorium on the development of artificial intelligence systems. However, the letter is not all that it seems. Some of the thousands of signatories have withdrawn their support and others turn out to be fake. The Future of Life Institute, the think tank that coordinated the effort, is mainly funded by the Musk Foundation and has been criticised for scaremongering. But are the concerns valid? The letter follows a Goldman Sachs report suggesting that AI could produce, quote, significant disruption as up to 300 million jobs could become automated. Dr Henry Shevlin is Senior Research Associate at the Leverhulme Centre for the Future of Intelligence, specialising in ethics and AI, and joins me now again. Welcome back to GB News. Um, I was reading the Telegraph yesterday, uh, at the most apocalyptic, people saying that AI systems could, as it were, take against humanity and destroy humanity. What, what, what do you say to that proposition? Well, it's a familiar scenario from science fiction, of course, movies like mm. The Terminator, and I think it's easy to dismiss it as mere science fiction. I would say, for my part, that I think a lot of senior developers of tech, a lot of senior figures in the industry, have legitimate concerns along these lines. That said, I think it's impo important also not to fall into scaremongering and panic. This is something that we should be aware of as a remote but significant possibility and treat it as something to, further down the road to be avoided rather than as an imminent threat. I suppose in that sense, I mean, you could sort of relate it to the, the threat of nuclear weapons. I mean, is, is this a threat that you're confident we can control? And if you are so confident, you know, where does that place, as it were, bad people? Because, you know, these technologies have a lot of potential. Absolutely. I think malevolent actors or misuse cases are one of the primary threats here. There's a whole gamut of possible misuses of this technology, which is incredibly powerful. I think a good historical analogy would be something like nuclear power. Just as nuclear power yeah. does present real risks, as we saw in places like Chernobyl and Fukushima, so too does it have immense potential for social good and has been itself subject to a kind of scaremongering in the past. Mm. So I think balancing the real risks of AI, which run from everything from uh, the overuse of algorithms that are biased or produce greater inequality to more long-term threats, including existential ones and misuse cases, balancing those against a healthy dose of uh, pragmatism about the immense potential economic benefits of this technology seems to be the way forward for me. Musk and Wozniak were calling for a summer, that is, uh, as it were, a summer break mm. in which we would give time for society, for humanity to catch up. Is, is, is that realistic? Do you, do you subscribe to that, that the technology is running ahead of, uh, what, regulators? I think certainly there's a danger at the moment that because the technology is moving so fast, just in the last three months alone, we've seen the launch of countless new AI systems. I think there is a danger that regulators will be too slow to correctly anticipate the kind of law, legal changes or oversight mechanisms that are required. I would like to think that an AI summer would be uh, an AI period of an AI pause would be on the cards. But even if that is a lot to ask for currently, I think one good function of the letter is drawing gr great public attention to the fact that these systems do have risks associated with them. Back in the 1970s, I was asked by a politician to write a speech about the future of the microchip. Um, and I wrote the speech. Of course, I was unable to predict any of the things that we now take for granted in life. Um, people are talking about AI, artificial intelligence, as being a moment like the invention of electricity, the invention of the internet. But do you have the imagination to know why it is so significant? Can you imagine what changes it's going to make to us? I think one big change is that in the past, automation has mostly been about allowing us to do routine tasks without the need for involvement by uh, specialists, um, without the need for human involvement. Think of the revolution in the textile industry, in the Industrial Revolution, for example. And one striking capability of AI is that it allows us to make non-routine tasks, tasks that require specialised forms of cognitive labour, things like uh, composition or coding uh, or, or journalism, for that matter. Um, these are now the kinds of tasks where we could see a great a role for automation and machines. So in that sense, I think it is a really significant technological and social development. 
Would you compare it with electricity and the development of the internet? I would say those are useful analogies, yes. Uh, we, remains to be seen whether the scale of change over the next decade uh, quite equals those obviously monumental shifts in human technology and society. However, uh, early indications are that this could have massive impact on labour markets, as we saw, for example, from the Goldman Sachs report. And I think it's very likely that the world 10 years from now will be quite a different place. Yeah, we need somehow to balance our understanding of the opportunities and of the risks. Uh, many thanks indeed to uh, Henry Shevlin. Um, in just over a month's time, King Charles will be crowned in Westminster Abbey, the first coronation since his mother's 70 years ago. While it has been reported that this will be a pared-back ceremony to reflect the modern royal family, ancient traditions will be observed. The Stone of Schoon also known as the Stone of Destiny, is an ancient symbol and a sacred object that was used for centuries in the inauguration of Scotland's kings. But in 1296, it was seized from Scotland by England's King Edward I, who built it into a new throne at Westminster. And thereafter, it was used in the coronation ceremonies of English monarchs and of English and Scottish monarchs after the crowns were united in 1603. Under John Major's government, the stone was returned to Scotland in 1996. Now it's expected to travel south briefly for the coronation. Dominic Selwood is an historian and author and joins me now. Can, can we give the viewers some idea, Jonathan, welcome to GB News, of the significance of this stone? Why might this object be invested with such properties? It's actually really quite fascinating because it's visually such a big part of the coronation. It sits under the throne and has done for 700 years. Um, and it's a symbol, really, of a history that goes back beyond the Christian ceremony of the coronation, which is actually effectively an adapted consecration of a bishop ceremony. It used to be called a consecratio regis, the consecration of the king. This goes back to ancient Celtic custom. This is, in fact, a tribal chieftain's stone for sitting on from before all of that Christian liturgy. So it's a visual reminder of a history that goes back even beyond the Anglo-Saxon rites of coronation that we'll be witnessing next month. And it was originally placed at where we now have the Palace of Schoon. Is that correct? That's where it, it used to be. And, and, and that is a very important site in itself. It is. It's a piece of sandstone that was quarried close to Schoon, near Perth. In the legends about it, though, which of course was so important in the medieval period, went back even further. They said it was the pillow on which Jacob laid his head when he saw the ladder going up to mm -hmm. heaven. It was the stone that came from Iona. It had maybe been at the hill of Tara, where the kings of Leinster, the high kings of Ireland, were usually crowned. So it had this very long Celtic and then even biblical prehistory. Why did the English king, uh, Edward I, pinch it? What was this? Was this a humiliation that he inflicted on the Scots? Was it intended to be that? It's, it's both a humiliation, but also a very important political point, because Edward was always campaigning in Scotland. And on this occasion, he won. And he was saying, you no longer have the ability to crown kings. I'm taking your king-making equipment, and I'm taking it to London, which says, firstly, you can't do it, but secondly, I am now the rightful king of Scotland. Mm. And did the controversy in any way abate when the, uh, when the two crowns were united in 1603? In fact, as recently as well, uh, as recently after the theft as the 14th century, when there was peace with Scotland, Edward III said to the abbot of Westminster, you need to send it back to Scotland now. And he didn't. But when James I came down, James VI and I, and became the first unified monarch, before the nations were unified, but when the monarchy was unified, he was very happy to use it. And it was a symbol of the, of the jointness of the two crowns. But then after the actual union in 1707, it became just part of, of, of Great Britain's story and the monarchy and power of Great Britain, which in a sense it still is. Great Britain is expansive, covers Scotland. So it's still owned, in effect, by you know, the monarchy, but it's been entrusted to the commissioners for the regalia in Scotland to look after. Well, when I was in government, in a Conservative government that was trying to avoid a devolution and, of course, Scottish independence, Michael Forsyth, the Secretary of State for Scotland, came up with the idea, and it was all news to me at the time, that the Stone of Schoon should go back to Scotland. And so it did in 1996. Um, how was that greeted by the Scottish people, do you think? Was it an important symbol to them by that stage? Yes, it was, because in Scotland, it's more usually known as the, the, 
stone of destiny. Destiny, yeah. <laughs> right, so it has this great sort of significance and symbolism. And uh, if you go back and watch the newsreels of the time, there was very genuine glee uh, and happiness that it was coming back. But it was also, you know, wrapped in with hope about this is the first stage towards devolution, possibly independence. Um, and so, yes, it, it's a highly symbolic, almost kind of totemic artefact. Have you any idea at all about how this stone will make the journey? Presumably with great security. I imagine it'll be huge security. It was, of course, when it, when it was last moved in 1950, when it was stolen by Scottish nationalists, uh, or repatriated by Scottish nationalists, and then the Scottish authorities gave it back. It had a very exciting secretive journey. It was buried in a field. It was done with sort of great, um, very, very clandestine. Now I expect there will be there will be a lot of security, but possibly also a lot of ceremony because this is this will be part of the build up to the coronation. And you think King Charles III will be extremely conscious of what he's sitting above? I, I'm certain he will be. When one thinks about the, the moment that he became king, I mean, the, that extraordinary um, itinerary he went on around Great Britain, going to Ireland, going to Scotland, going to Wales, it was very important for him to bring the nation together. And so, yes, that is a symbol of something that is not exclusively English. Around the United Kingdom he went, actually. United Kingdom, yes, yes thank went, you. Went to <laughs> as well. uh, Dominic, uh, fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Dominic Selwood. Well, um, coming up, uh, Easter is very nearly upon us and we'll be spending nearly four million pounds on chocolate eggs. I'll be tasting a sample after the break. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate okay, Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News.
Uh, welcome back. It's worth an estimated £400 million, but this year the cost of living crisis may take the bite out of the chocolate egg market. The prices of the ingredients for Easter eggs, uh, butter, eggs, cocoa and sugar have risen month after month since last summer, with sugar at a six-year high. However, the shelves are still filled with eggs of many sizes and qualities, and consumer demand remains pretty high. David greenwood Heish is uh, an international chocolatier and joins me again. Uh, welcome back to GB News Thank with a few much. samples. Um, now, I talked about variety of quality. Mm -hmm. Presumably there is a huge variety of quality on what's on sale. And it's really difficult to uh, decode that because Easter eggs come in fancy packages and they look very pretty and the boxes are four times bigger than the product inside. So until you've opened it, you don't really know uh, which you're going to get. There are, there's nothing on the table more than seven pounds today, but you can pay 150 pounds for an Easter egg. Uh, you can certainly pay 15, 20, 30 pounds at your local supermarket. Um, you and I have talked about um, chocolate before and I learnt a lot on the last occasion. Is there anything special about putting chocolate into an egg? Why is it so popular with us, do you think? Uh, well, the, the history of it would go back way to, to Egyptians, so there are, there are some uh, uh, religious... and then it came to Christians, and so we've got all the pagan uh, traditions of, of eggs and rebirth and those things. Yes. Uh, then the Germans uh, invented advent calendars and started making solid chocolate eggs solid, which were really expensive because chocolate came halfway around the world. And then we di discovered a method of making a shell. Uh, and so as chocolate became more refined, we could make it into shapes and mould it. Uh, once you could have a hollow egg, that meant the masses could have eggs because mm. it was cheaper. Uh, and we've not had that for a couple of hundred years, probably. It may sound a daft question, but does shape make any difference to it, taste? Huge difference. Does uh, it? You may notice one of the major manufacturers changed the squares on their bars to have a little wave on the back of it because it melts at, di at different points because the thin end melts quicker than the thick end. Wow. And it tastes creamier in your mouth. The science, scientific uh, studies have proved. Well, now, um, we've got a couple of minutes. Would you like to run us through your eggs or... or Offer me some highlights, whatever you think's best, really. Well, I think what we'd, I'd like to do is just break one of them open and let you, mm. let you try one of okay. the, the eggs. Let's try a, a dark one. One of the key things I'd like to say is uh, the number one ingredient when we read the label, because we go through the look, touch, smell and use all our senses, mm. the number one ingredient should be chocolate. Uh, of course. A couple of these eggs here, the number one ingredient is sugar. Uh, and you would notice a huge difference between this and those. I won't do the comparison because I'm not here to bash people. I'm going to bash this egg on the... I was going to say, how do you get into an egg? I'm, I'm going to... Whoa! Do that. Good man. Now, last time you were on, you told me to listen to chocolate. Absolutely, <laughs> sir. So, so if, you hold, if you hold that to your ear, and, and usually the first thing it says is, eat me. <laughs> yeah. But if you then break your chocolate, it should have a crisp ring and a snap. Oh, yes. You can hear that ring. The more cocoa that's in there, the louder that noise will be. So a milk chocolate egg wouldn't make as, as loud a noise and white chocolate would be even quieter still. Now, I'm anxious to taste this egg, but again, you want me to go through a procedure, don't you? I'd, I'd like you to smell the egg, so, so you, you shouldn't it... smell chemicals in there, you no, shouldn't no, smell not. anything unpleasant, it should be really chocolatey. It's a really lovely smell, this one. And then you may remember the isolating your olfactory, so you're going to put a piece onto your tongue pinch your nose slightly, uh, and that will you'll only taste the one of the five things, which is sweet. When you need to breathe, release your nose, open your mouth a little and breathe in through your mouth and out through your nose. And that should go from just sweet to an, a burst of flavour, and you'll start to experience... Brilliant burst of flavour. What does this um, egg retail at? That, uh, 6 pounds mm. So it's a really... You can get a really good egg for six ninety nine. Absolutely. Do you get anything inside, or is just no, a, no, that, that's, that's a hollow egg. Uh, and there's three in that range uh, that I've taken. And the, I bought these from a discounter, so I've not gone to some of the uh, high end shops because you can find some really good products elsewhere. What are the weird looking ones at the end? They look well. One of them's a cocoa pod. I, ah, okay. So that's a real cocoa pod. If I bring this across, gosh, that's an extraordinary and object. And this is. Uh, 
two Easter eggs, in effect, put, put together in, a, in an artistic shape. Uh, and we've got dark chocolate, that's a 70% uh, chocolate. Uh, this one from Madagascar, you taste this one, which is from Ghana, and we can taste those as well. And get, we hear the, the fabulous crack. You can look at the thickness. Easter eggs uh, are usually made with thinner chocolate. Yeah, that's because you thick. can spin them. Uh, they go into a spinning machine, and it ensures you get a thin coat. That means you get a quicker melt in your mouth, so you get the smoother and the hit of flavour quicker than you would from a bar. David, I only made you smash another egg because uh, <laughs> at the end of all this, the, the crew out there like to uh, eat all the chocolates. They've I just made you them. smash another one. David, thank you so much for coming back on GB News. Um, Emily Carver's here. You're going to be uh, taking over in a couple of minutes. What's on your show? You had a nice end to your show, didn't you? Uh, we often do. May I try some in the break? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank you. Fabulous. Uh, we're going to be talking about this uh, new Indo-Pacific trade deal. What do people make of it at home? Do they think it's a great Brexit victory or is it a disappointment compared to the European Union? I've noticed, have you noticed the same, that there are some people who like to talk this down. They're not impressed. They think this is, uh, yes, a massive disappointment and that we shouldn't celebrate something like this. But I think it's a win. Yep, so it sounds like you have a very clear point of view. I think I do, but I, uh, you know, I'll speak to the experts, see what's going on, see how much it's going to be worth, the importance of it geopolitically, financially, economically, we shall see. Well, Emily, it's, it's marvellous, because um, despite many things I covered on my show today, I certainly didn't go anywhere near that subject. Ah, excellent. So there's, uh, <laughs> there's plenty for people to ponder. So Emily will be here in a moment. Uh, many thanks to uh, David greenwood Hedge. Um, so, uh, thanks to all my guests this week. Um, I will be taking a break next week, and so it will be a Sunday with uh, Olivia Utley next week. Um, I'll also be away the week after that, but I can't wait to be back and to see you again soon. And meanwhile, please enjoy your Easter eggs, and remember to go through the procedure of listening first, put, holding your nose and putting it on your tongue. Goodbye. Hello, I'm Craig Snow and here is your latest forecast from the Met Office. Well, as we go through the next few days, for most of us, it is going to be dry with uh, plenty of sunshine, but that will certainly lead to some frosty nights still. So here's the situation. We've got high pressure generally in charge of the weather, keeping things settled, but weather fronts always close by across the north, so here still the risk of some splashes of rain from time to time. So for the rest of Sunday, for a lot of England and Wales, we end the day on a clear and dry note. And the clear skies will eventually spread their way into Scotland as the night goes on. But for Northern Ireland, we'll hang on to some cloud here. And thanks to a southerly breeze, temperatures here probably remaining around five to six degrees. But elsewhere, certainly a touch of frost, at least in the countryside. But that will set us up for a lovely start to the new working week. Lots of sunshine for the country. But again, Northern Ireland hanging on to a little bit more with the way of cloud here. So sunshine rather limited. And thanks to that breeze, temperatures probably not reaching much higher than 9 to 11 degrees. But elsewhere in the sunshine, after that cold start, we will see highs reaching 14, possibly 15 degrees. So feeling fairly pleasant for the time of year. Into the evening, very little changes really across England, Scotland and Wales. Lots of sunshine to end the day, but again, the cloud continuing across Northern Ireland. And as we go through the course of the night, we will actually start to see some rain arriving here. And that may well also just arrive into the far west of Scotland as the night goes on. But elsewhere, under the clear skies, another frosty night to come. With, again, in the countryside, temperatures falling probably to around minus two, maybe even minus three degrees. But that will again give us a fairly lovely start across England and Wales and also eastern Scotland and very little changes as we go through the course of the day. But for western Scotland and Northern Ireland here, always the risk of some splashes of rain. And this rain will eventually move in across other parts of the country as we go into the middle of the week. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Rooms. Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News.
The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by Headliners on 